So we're going to talk a little more about America today. And in case you're wondering, yes, this, this is the same outfit from the last video. I wanted to do all these while they were still fresh in my mind. And if you watched the last video, you know that it was about the American spirit, yeah? Or the uh, faded memory and dream thereof. About how we're not as bold as we maybe like to think we are. Or that if we think we are, we typically tend to think so for what you might say are the wrong reasons. But all the same, another end, another aspect of this thought process of mine comes back to actually sort of what I feel is, if not the antithesis, maybe the replacement for that. And it's something I'm calling the American condition. Now, what is the American condition? It's going to sound a little harsh. It's going to upset some people. It's going to be the kind of thing where I'm told that I should go back to wherever else I came from. The American condition is increasingly one of a willful ignorance and almost giddy fear. Now, it's been going on for quite a while, but there are a few points in history that we can really look to to see this sort of embodied, how it came about, how it seemed to grow. Now, the ignorance doesn't come from the notion that all oh, Americans are just stupid. I would never say that, actually. Even though we're not the best educated people on Earth, but I'd say in many cases that has a lot more to do with systems than people. But... When I say ignorant, I mean more in the respect that surprising amounts of people are rather easily goaded into defending the status quo. Now, you say that to most people, it doesn't matter who's in charge, what party's in charge, whether the economy is doing great, aka whether the stock market is doing fantastic and the rich are getting richer. Um, but it has more to do actually with the general sense that seems to permeate almost all facets of our political spectrum, of our, of our popular thought. And that's that there's something fundamentally wrong or a whole bunch of things that are fundamentally wrong with our world, with our society. Now, at a certain point, on a base level, I think most of us can probably agree with that. In fact, in general, be it society or really any other pursuit in a universe such as ours, where very little, if anything, is actually static and permanent outside of more fundamental laws and things like gravity, which, well, that's a different conversation. But all the same, the closest anyone could ever actually get to achieving perfection in any respect would be perpetually improving upon what you have, constantly refining, constantly getting better. But let's step back from the broader philosophical understanding of there. What we can say is that most people who give any thought or pay any attention to the world around them recognize that even if they can't genuinely articulate or understand what it is, something or a handful of things is very, very wrong. We have a lot of ways to go before we genuinely reach to something we could call perfect. Now, when you get into the specifics about what that is, typically partisanship tends to dip its toe in that water and poison everything in the process because, well, if you happen to fall on the right side of things, well, then, of course, everything that's coming from the left, the dirty commies, the socialists, the SJWs, all of that, that's what's ruining everything. That's what's ruining everything. Everything would be fine if they just went away. And if you were on the left side of things, well, then, of course, it's all of the, the, the hateful, racist, bigot, nationalist Nazis on the other side. That's if we could get rid of that. If we could get rid of all the tradition and religion, that would be fine. Blah, back and forth. And then it just creates the wheel. And the wheel just keeps spinning. But one thing we can agree on, without getting into specifics, is that the status quo is not good. We need to fight status quo in one way or another. Now, here's the thing. The status quo is not created overnight. Uh, existing conditions that everyone just sort of seems to accept as being just part of life in the world, things that we should maybe try and do something about, but who knows how. The status quo itself is not made overnight. In fact, it's got something of a sort of, I guess you'd call it kind of a mission creep to it. So if we consider the American condition, we are sold on the status quo. We're sold on it by virtue of political messages. We're sold on it by virtue of conventional advertising and marketing. We're sold on it especially by virtue of social media. And we're sold these things in many different ways. Now, we can kind of, in a certain respect, go back to the days of Woodrow Wilson and consider the advent of modern marketing and public relations under the likes of George Creel or Edwin Bernays or, uh, to a lesser extent, Lippmann there. 
And we can look back to the Committee on Public Information. We can look back on the, on the ginning up of support for World War I, which at the time, a majority of Americans were not genuinely in favor of getting involved in. We weren't necessarily an isolationist nation, but to us, that was their war, not ours. We had our own things to be concerned with. And in terms of politics at the time, prior to this evolution, marketing and public relations, well, the political dynamics as we think of them today weren't exactly as they are now. In fact, they were quite a bit, and some might say, more open in terms of the various sorts of ideas that were bandied back and forth, the sort of ideological or philosophical precepts which were acceptable or not acceptable. Now, it strikes a lot of people as mind-blowing to find out that Karl Marx, back in his day, actually wrote a letter alongside the other members of one of his initial workers' movements to actually congratulate Abraham Lincoln on being re-elected president, and that Lincoln's own uh, ambassador to London, um, uh, Charles Francis Adams, who I believe was the grandson of ugh, either Samuel, no, John or... Well, the, the lineage escapes me at the moment, but all the same, in their correspondence, which was quite friendly, uh, a, a very overall sort of amicable sort of back and forth regarding the ideas about uh, equality for worker, workers in the working class, about the, the liberation of what they would come to call the proletariat, those sorts of things. These were not wholly anathema to the White House at the time, to the American public in general. And even up through the time of Woodrow Wilson, there were things such as socialist newspapers, socialist mayors in some towns. There was a, a, not a huge political movement in there, but the notions were, they existed. And they weren't seen as entirely, wholly, universally antithetical to American thinking. What changed? Marketing and PR. If nothing else, it's safe to say that the marketing and public relations industries themselves, which, let's be honest, in this day and age, our elections themselves, our political processes, are not exactly stately affairs rooted and framed around ideas, policies, about what will make the nation greater, as much as they are dog and pony shows of celebrity worship, scandal, and headlines. If it bleeds, it leads. Any old headline will do, so long as you can catch enough eyeballs, get enough clicks, sell enough papers. And that's what really pushes our election. Our politicians spend generally more time thinking about how to present a policy than they tend to seem to think about how that a policy will altogether affect Americans in general. The messaging and marketing of ideas tends to overshadow and overtake the real purpose of government and public institutions. That's why we constantly hear about how things are being politicized when they are in fact matters of actual public policy, public welfare, and public good. The politicization of major issues in our country is done through the same sorts of series of marketing and advertising that we see convincing Americans in general that we all will never be happy until we have that brand new 2019 model truck, until we have a new sunroom on our expanding house, until we have the greenest lawn on the block, until we can vacation in exotic locales and have our own yachts, etc., etc. It's a lifestyle obsession which has taken over so much of the American psyche and turned us, as we hear so many people saying, into mindless consumers. But with that mindlessness, with that obsession, with that dog and pony distraction, not only bringing our attention away from things, which we could probably on at least some level agree, are universally more important than that new iPhone or that fancy new car. In that same respect, they're also numbing us. And they've been doing so for a very long time. And if you need evidence of this, just consider how shocking some people find the true political history to this country to be when they find out that there was such a greater diversity of overall thought a hundred or so years ago than there is actually now. Now what we have, if you were to ask the average sort of dime store politico, well, they'd probably tell you that it comes down to left and right. Now we've got a politically correct... Uh, hypersensitive dreamer kind of movement against a gritty sort of realist nationalist patriot set and we will defend this country at all costs because as we all know we are constantly under threat and there comes the next kind of kind of grab the next sort of hook in this whole american condition 
the fear. Now we are marketed this fear regularly. And if we need a, in a modern example, which at least a good portion of my audience would have been old enough to remember, it was the world of post 9-11. Now sure, we did have these shining moments of senses of a national unity, that we are Americans, that America is the greatest nation on earth because we stand for meaningful things, and that we will not be cowed or terrorized by adversaries of any kind, and that we will continue to maintain our principles, except in the course of us attempting to defend ourselves after that attack, and effectively, in many senses, kind of giving in to exactly what the attacks were meant to inspire in the first place. A deep-seated fear and paranoia overtook us. And in this, we did find a perfect unholy marriage of political opportunism, oftentimes backed by corporate interests who saw a great big blank check the moment they saw those towers explode, and a media who knew that moving several steps beyond just purveying and, and presenting information of the day, telling us the news, well, that they could become infotainment, that they could very easily sew up commercial markets and that those commercial markets themselves would not only make those media companies fabulously wealthy, but they would also help expound narratives, which continued to double down on what it was that was making them fabulously wealthy. And at the same time, getting to where we are now today, especially when we consider the nature of social media, it's perfectly acceptable in this day and age to say that you are telling the truth and correct without necessarily having to prove anything simple by, by simple virtue of how many people click on your shit. How many people share your stuff on Facebook? It's easy to forget in this day and age, with media and information flying at us so fast, it's easy to forget that even as recently as 2016, the notion of fake news and the post-truth world that we live in was coined by elements within the media who saw this ability for especially upstart media companies to just push abject bullshit on the public because it would prey on the fears and the preconceptions and deeply ingrained notions that had already been banged into their head by political marketing for so long that it would sew up yet another media market. And within all of this, especially in the post 9-11 world, fear became the hottest marketing tool out there. Al-Qaeda is coming for your children. Do you know those strangers down the street? Who is that person who looked at you out on the sidewalk? W will these immigrants come and destroy us and bring disease and death and rape and murder and drugs and all of that? Oh my God, if you don't know them, you can't trust them. And we don't just see this with politics. We see it just as readily, too, in the evolution of such when it comes to the simple matters of parenting. It's a funny notion when we have to be reminded that we are not as important as we like to think we are. We are not as important as the media puffs us up to be so that we can convince ourselves that once we get the new car and iPhone that we will ourselves be better versions than we've ever been before. And the same goes for our children. Because not every man who plays with a child on a playground who is not their own is a pedophile, to quote Scroobius Pip. Not every time your children are out of your sight will they be abducted and raped and mutilated and chopped up and turned into soup. But if you were to listen to the news media, if you were to listen to increasing numbers of uh, hysterical family experts, well, then that would seem to be the case, wouldn't it? Even though, fundamentally, we all know it's not the case. And in this, we see this fear driving so much of what it is we do on a day-to-day -day basis with our personal and professional lives. We see this fear even actually sort of goading us into feeling things like indifference. I've spoken about it here before, and I believe it remains just as true now. The fear that um, the only thing that kept you from becoming that homeless bum down the street who constantly begs for change was your own hard work. And that even though you've worked yourself to the bone, one day you'll have that big house, you'll have that yacht, you'll have that timeshare. You will have everything. You will have it all, kid. If you just work harder, don't ask questions, be happy with the job that you have, because one day you might be able to even be your boss. Ooh. But we've been sold a bill of false goods, and we defend it 
Because the terror of actually having to acknowledge our own passive acceptance and support of a status quo, and our fear of perhaps upending systems and balances that we feel are utterly essential, that we've always had, despite the fact that so many of them are relatively new, it really keeps us from even considering taking any kind of bold steps in any particular directions. We are all in this sense, in our bold and strident beliefs, or even in our sort of passive acceptance of things and our perhaps genuine hopes that they may just get better. We are passive supporters of this status quo, which it seems that nearly all of us know isn't working, that it's not functioning. And the moment we hear anything which runs contrary either to that which we understand and have grown to accept as the norm, the way the world has always been, the thing that has given us everything that we have, even if what we have is not quite as much as perhaps our labors ought to have earned us, well, that would, that's simply unacceptable at that point. We can't run that risk. Because think of all we have to lose. This is the American condition. It's a passive surrender of the American spirit which says that we can, in fact, accomplish anything. And there's a fearful self-delusion that we are still clinging to that same spirit while we are perpetually and, and, and routinely surrendering to an increasingly commercialized status quo. You want one more example of this? Consider our politics. Can you consider the? Can you, can you really genuinely remember the last time you heard somebody, whether you agreed with them or not, but who functioned, spoke as, and was presented in a genuinely stately manner? Whoever went anywhere in American politics, because whether you're a Trump fan or you love AOC, it's not so much any sense of stately acumen political acumen, or even a political virtue of any real respect that most of the fan bases of these people seem to be going for. It's just that they're their favorite contestant on the island and they really hope they don't get voted off at the next meeting. We have become Mike Judge's idiocracy with layers of children of men just below it. Oh, and if you want a solution, Try to recognize this. Try to think. Try not to give in to the news cycles. Try not to just leap from one stone in this river to the next without paying attention to where it is it's leading. Because that's how we got here. Accepting that things are the way they are and that's the way they've always been without even realizing how much our common perception of the way things are and the way things have been has been wholesale manipulated even from nearly the beginning of this nation. See you in the next one. It'll be cheerier, I promise. <laughs>